Peter emphasized the unique opportunity that we have at the University of Saskatchewan, where we actually have a single college that encompasses the social sciences, the sciences, the humanities, and fine arts, and, and that this structure uniquely positions us on the national landscape. So I'd like to invite Peter forward, uh, not to talk about blues guitar today, but to talk about the objectives of curriculum renewal in arts and science. Thank you, Peter. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction or biopsy. Um, it, was, it was not painful to listen to that, um, and some of it was true. Um, it's, uh, it is a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Thank you very much for inviting me. I was told that I had 20 minutes, but people were very relieved when I said I would only take 10 minutes. Um, and uh, I have a lot of things that I would like to say about the importance of curricular renewal in the College of Arts and Science. I'll say a few of them. I wanted, first of all, though, to mention that it's when, when you come to an occasion like this at this university, I can tell you every year it makes one so proud to be involved in some way or other with this university. It's a very close university, as our provost was saying and our vice provost has said. It's a, a university that puts a lot of emphasis on teaching and uh, in a very you know, strategic and thoughtful way on the integration of teaching and research. And it's, it's just so fabulous to be part of that. It's also wonderful to see family members here, members from the community, as well as faculty and administrators and from all across the university. So thanks a lot for asking me to speak today. I am speaking about um, a curriculum renewal process that we are undertaking in the College of Arts and Science. And I thought long and hard about all the kinds of things that one could say about that and then what, what would be most useful to say to this group about all of that. And it reminded me of the fact that every year, at this time of the year, people in my position and particularly deans of faculties of arts, colleges of arts, science, fine arts, and I'll say a little bit more about what all that means in a moment. Patty alluded to it. Are always called upon by the media when the question of the value of a university education is raised. And I'm always bemused by that question because it's always phrased that way. What is the value of a university education? But what is really meant is, what's the value of the kind of education that you get at a college like arts and science? Nobody is asking, what's the value of an engineering degree? Or what's the value of a medical degree? Or what's the value of a dentistry degree? And, and I think that's fair. But what they really mean by a university degree is, um, you know, what, what's the value of, of, of an arts and science degree? It reminds me of when I was an undergraduate student at Queen's University in the mid-70s. And there was a slogan that arts and science students used to use all the time. I may not get good marks, but I'm no athlete. And <laughs> I pondered that. I pondered that one, actually thought back on that one for a long time particularly when at this time of the year I am asked to uh, speak to the media and, and, and in other uh, venues about the value of the kind of education that we offer in arts and science. So that value is frequently questioned and that point is actually fundamental to why we are looking at renewing our curriculum. That's the first thing that I wanted to say. Second thing is, I think, and a lot of people help me to think this way, that if you are going to talk about the value of the kind of education that you get um, in the arts and science areas, and here that means everything from a, a Bachelor of Fine Arts to a Bachelor of Arts to a Bachelor of Science, if you're going to think about the value of those, you can think about that in monetary terms. What does it mean for you in terms of lifetime earnings? You can think about that in terms of how you are going to contribute to society, and you can think about that in terms of the kinds of skills that you are going to acquire that employers need. And I want to say a little bit about each of those, and what I am going to say essentially amounts to the fact that no matter how you look at it, it is incontrovertible that there is tremendous value to getting one of these degrees. Nonetheless, that value is always questioned. Here are a few facts. A student who graduates um, with one of those degrees from a college like our College of Arts and Science, at least statistically across this country, we know will earn one million more dollars across a lifetime 
than somebody who has a college certificate or diploma. And let me pause here and say something about that comparator. To me, the mission of the University of Saskatchewan and the mission of something, of an institution that offers college diplomas or certificates are different missions, but they're very compatible. And I think there are wonderful ways we are exploring a lot of them and in fact have made a lot of them tangible with reciprocal agreements. There are lots of ways in which we can encourage students at those two kinds of institutions to build on what they can learn at each of them to come out at the end with a combination of the kind of degree that we offer and the kind of certificate or diploma that a college offers. Nonetheless, one million more dollars will be earned by a student graduating with a university degree. $28,000 per year more on average. The unemployment rate, and I'll just throw out a bunch of statistics here, I think you'll find them interesting. Many of them you might know or, in, or intuitively believe in the first place. The unemployment rate is lower by 3.3% than, than the national average of unemployment for people with college certificates or diplomas. Only 3% of arts and science alumni are unemployed or seeking work. Following the 2008 recession, Ontario did a study of the sustainability, let's say, in the workplace of people who had humanities degrees. And 91% of humanities grads were employed. 94% of university grads across all disciplines, colleges, and faculties were employed. Um, on average, all of them were making $50,000 more per year. And all of this was when unemployment was rising quickly. So in other words, one is more recession-proof with an arts and science degree. Twice as many new jobs in Canada will be created for arts and science grads as for college diploma or certificate graduates um, and have been since 2008. Canada will require university educated workers to offset a massive retirement boom. More than six million Canadians are anticipated to retire in the next decade. 92% of arts and science alumni found their employment satisfying or highly satisfying Six of nine sitting Supreme Court judges have BAs. 40% of students in Canada graduate debt-free. 20% owe less than $12,000. But the value is still questioned. Every year, it is questioned. In terms of skills training value, graduates of arts and science have the skills employers are seeking. Many of you will know the work of, and particularly the, the talks by Sir Ken Robinson, who uh, does a lot of work in terms of, sort of creative pedagogy and creative teaching, creative education. And one of his main points is that we tend to fail at training incoming students for a future workplace that we can't actually clearly imagine when we focus on applied skills. What the workplace says that it needs are transferable skills and flexible skills. We know that a person will have many career positions over a lifetime and will be transferring from one to another. What will be necessary in order to allow that to occur are skills such as communication, leadership, global awareness, problem solving, and analytical skills. And we like to think in arts and science, and I think faculties or colleges of arts and science across the country like to think that all of those are embedded in the curricula that students experience, but still the value is questioned. I'll just mention one other kind of value. Let's call it a contributory value. What one can contribute to one's community, however you might define that. Graduates with those skills that I just mentioned will help their communities, their families, their friends, organizations, provinces, cities, countries. We know that. We know that the major problems that, have, that face the world today, leadership problems, famine, water security, poverty, racial inequality, gender inequality, the list goes on. None of them will be solved from the perspective of a single discipline. All of them are solvable only if we bring a variety of disciplines to the same table and look at them from those perspectives. There's a wonderful book by Chris Hedges called The Empire of Illusion, and he writes in there at one point, the measure of a civilization is its compassion, not its ability to consume. Still the value of an arts and science degree remains questioned annually. 
If that value remains questioned, we need to look at our curricula to see if an answer lies there, and it does, but it's implicit in there only. So one factor in renewing and improving curricula is to introduce into them what students want and what employers want while maintaining academic integrity and curiosity-driven learning. We don't tend to think openly about what students want and what employers want. We think a lot about maintaining academic integrity and curiosity-driven learning. But it's a fascinating process to try to put those three together. Another is to make not just disciplinary programming, but interdisciplinary programming foundational to a student's experience so that every student can experience how all disciplines borrow and reinvent each other's work. And here I would like to reflect on something that Patty said when she was uh, talking about the College of Arts and Science and what I often say about it. I talk about this aspect of it because I didn't really realize that even though I had taught in that college for many years, that the college is unique in the country. It spans across 21 departments and many other kinds of interdisciplinary programs, everything from the fine arts through the humanities, through the social sciences and the sciences. There actually is no other university in the country that has a college that does all of those things. There are two other universities, University of Toronto and Queen's, that come close. They have faculties or colleges of what they call arts and science, but neither of those two, nevertheless, includes as much as we do. At the University of Toronto, for instance, which includes much of what we do, uh, the faculty of music or College of Music is, is separate from the Faculty of Arts and Science. So we find ourselves through historical fiat and a variety of other reasons that I won't go into now, with a college that actually spans 21 core disciplines and exponentially more when one thinks about the interdisciplinary opportunities. And that's something that we are trying to build on. We used to see that. I used to experience that as a faculty member in the English department in the College of Arts and Science as a bit of an albatross around faculty members' necks. There, were, there was too much going on in that college. It had too many different kinds of academic and intellectual identities to cohere. But the other way of looking at that is that there is enormous potential in there to create unique programming for students that they actually can't get anywhere else. So another way to uh, have a curriculum respond to the question of value is to make not just disciplinary programming but interdisciplinary programming foundational to a student's experience. Imagine, for example, and along with Associate Dean of Students Gordon Debrze, who's here today, and Linda McMullen, the Acting Vice Dean of the Division of Social Sciences, who is here today, and others in the college, imagine if you will, a first-year course that takes a theme such as beauty or creativity or AIDS and looks at that theme from a variety of perspectives by inviting faculty members from a variety of disciplines in to talk about what that means to them. Beauty, for instance, would be perceived by a studio art faculty member in one way by a music faculty member in another way, by a Masters of Fine Arts in Writing faculty member in yet another way, but by a mathematician who's thinking in terms of elegant equations and solutions in yet another way. And there's a common theme there of beauty that runs through all of it. Imagine being a first year student and being exposed to that kind of experience. It's not subject or discipline based, it's theme based, and one is bringing a variety of disciplines together to look at that theme one class after another after another. In the process, by the way, a student has the opportunity to sample many different ways of thinking, which we like to say is one of the real benefits of getting an arts and science degree. There is a very short amount of time in one's life when one has the opportunity, the luxury to do that. And if we can imagine a kind of first year experience that is based thematically um, and in an, in an interdisciplinary way, we begin to open that kind of experience up to students in, in a much more 
strategic and focused manner. Another response to how we can build the value of an arts and science degree more explicitly into um, a college curriculum is to agree, as we have as a college, on five, in our case, learning goals and make them explicit, not just for the student's sake, actually, although primarily, but also for potential employers' sakes. Employers are always saying that they require those kinds of transferable skills. And when I talk to alumni, by the way, from the College of Arts and Science, such as most recently the CEO of A&W Canada, fascinating guy by the name of Jeff Mooney, who got a degree in, guess what, philosophy. To connect the dots for me in terms of what he learned when he was an undergraduate student in the late 60s, getting a degree in philosophy, and how he turned that into leading the company that makes the best onion rings in the country. How do you do that? And he said to me, by the way, I could talk about onion rings for hours, don't get me started. And we went to McDonald's, I have to tell you. We couldn't find the A&W where we were. But anyway, the, 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 interesting, the interesting thing is that there is a latent value in what we do, but our role, our responsibility through a renewed curriculum is to make that value explicit, not just for students, though primarily, but also for potential employers. The five that we agreed upon as a college are the following, to develop a wide range of effective communication skills, to encourage personal development, growth, and responsibility, to engage students in inquiry-based learning, critical thinking, and creative processes, to prepare thoughtful, world-minded, educated, engaged citizens, and to cultivate an understanding of and deep respect for the unique socio-cultural positioning of Aboriginal peoples in Canada. All of that's a tall order. A lot of that actually, again, is implicit in the curricula that we offer, but not explicit. And it's interesting that when you identify those and try to identify where they are explicit in our curricula, you begin to realize um, that we could make them much more so, that there are many gaps. These are all pedagogically sound actions to take, and they also, by enriching the student experience, likely increase recruitment and retention rates, and let's not forget that. It's good to have a lot of students here for the university's sake. Primarily, it's important because it's great for students to be able to rub shoulders with each, with each other, learning from a variety of perspectives. Our departments have identified their program goals and are now mapping their curricula to those goals. And this is done with a lot of help from members of the University Learning Center, Cheryl Mills and Susan Benz in particular. And then shortly the process will begin of placing all of that against those five college level learning goals to see where there are gaps and how they can be bridged. All the people that we are here to celebrate today are excellent teachers because in the main they are passionate about what they do. I, I saw that Benita Beattie's phrase, your phrase Benita, was that it, it, it's teaching is a way of life, or if I didn't get the, that exactly right, it was close. And, and that's why so many of the people who are award winners that we're celebrating today have been able to achieve what they've been able to achieve. And all the other people who were shortlisted for and seriously considered for those awards too because it's a way of life. But the college, and this is the interesting thing to think about, and I'm sure other colleges think in exactly the same way, the college has an obligation to allow faculty to immerse themselves in a curriculum that is meaningful, worldly, stimulating, and purposeful. In other words, faculty can't just be great teachers on their own, even though they have it inside them to do that. They have to be given a curricular environment that they can really work with. Departments can, to a certain extent, do that for them. And when we talk about curriculum renewal in arts and science, we're not implying that somehow or other departments have not kept pace with their own disciplinary innovations. They have, and they're reflected in their curricula. It's at the college level, in terms of the overall interdisciplinary experience, that we need to sit back and assess how we can improve. So what we have been doing over the last two and a half, three years, is to really explore all of these issues, starting from the premise that it is worthwhile always to deeply, to intensively, and to strategically 
re-examine constantly what it is we're teaching, why, what the value of it is, and how we do it. It's something that, believe it or not, in the College of Arts and Science, we haven't done as a college for decades, and it's long overdue, and hence we're doing it. It was my predecessor, Joanne Dillon, the Dean of the College, about four years ago that started what she called the First Year Curriculum Advisory Committee, peopled by faculty who were award-winning teachers in the main, who were beginning to set out these concepts, and we're now at the point where we're doing that mapping and making it all tangible. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk about these things. The College of Arts and Science is approximately half of the university in terms of its student population of over 8,500 students. And it's important that all of this is done well and right. So thanks for letting me talk about it. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>